this podcast, you'll find interviews with high-performing, successful individuals in life sciences. On a weekly basis, we cover their proven methods, principles, strategies, and mindsets to implement new technologies that scale to meet the needs of people in our world. This episode of Life Science Success is brought to you by 5280 Life Sciences Consulting. If you need help setting your strategy, meeting your operational goals, or are selecting and implementing critical technology in your business, we should talk. Visit 5280lifescience.com to schedule a meeting and find out more. Today on the podcast, I'd like to welcome Michael Papadimitrius. Welcome, Michael. Hi there, Don. Thanks for having me. Uh, Can you tell the listeners a little bit about yourself? Yeah, so... I'm originally from Adelaide, Australia, so a little bit far away from where I currently am, but I think I often describe my career as being at the right place at the right time, so I've been really fortunate. So it first of all started off with me doing my undergrad degree with honours at Flinders University in South Australia. I then work in an immunology diagnostic pathology laboratory, so during this time doing a lot of the typical immunology tests, allergy screenings, and then even screening for blood cancers as well. After this, I was then approached to work for a research consortium where we were creating monoclonal antibodies, which were to be used for cell therapy and diagnostic purposes for different diseases. So this was a really good exposure to what it's like to work in the, I suppose, the industry environment as well. And this is actually where probably my passion for science really deepened. So I was quite lucky. I had a really good manager back then, and she sort of said, if you want to get anywhere, you need to have a PhD in science. So I was like, okay, (laughs) cool. I'm going to do this now. So I was like, okay, started looking for the PhD that was going to be the right fit for what I thought was going to be a really interesting area. And then, again, I was quite fortunate. I found a PhD in cell therapy. So with my PhD, I was just doing some research for about a novel type of cell therapy at the University of Sydney. And then, yeah, during that time as well, I was in contact with one of our vendors quite closely, and then I got to know them quite well. And then after a while, I was looking for a job when I was doing writing my thesis, and then a job opportunity came up with this company where I was able to pack up everything I had and move to Germany for this job. Wow. And yeah. That's extremely far distance too, so. Far distance, difference in... I don't want to say you know, cultures, yes, but it's a very similar lifestyle. You look at Germany, you look at Australia, you've got very good economies, you've got very good social networks, you've got very good infrastructure. So there are similarities. It's just they speak German over here. So yeah, so with this new job, I was the clinical car T cell product manager. And this just meant that I was responsible for marketing our car T cell portfolio to clinical customers. So I got to know a lot of different pharma companies, different biotech companies, even academic physicians where I was learning about what their needs are when they're treating patients with CAR T cells. And then a little while after I was there, that company for about two and a half years, the company started to set up a brand new daughter company where they wanted to create a pharmaceutical company now. So it's something a little bit different and obviously focusing on the drug product as opposed to how you make it now. And so I moved with that brand new pharmaceutical company to become a medical science liaison. And then I was in that role for a little while, but then they started to realize I had a lot of knowledge and expertise when it comes to CAR T cells. And that's one of the areas that we pharmaceutical companies researching right now. And they decided to make me the global uh, medical affairs manager for our brand new pharma company. Yeah. So it's really big deal. Very exciting. And a lot of learning on the job, right? now. That's a, it is excellent. And I, I visited Germany quite a few times and it's just really impressive how sci- some of the scientific clusters are and how they'll have almost a, an entire town dedicated to different companies that are developing things. So just an absolutely great place to be for sure for you and for your career growth. I love Australia, don't get me wrong, but I think if you were to be any places in the world in the pharma industry, I think generally Europe, US are And I'm going to say UK because they're now separated from the EU. But any one of those three, pretty big places to be. And some places within APAC as well, like in China as well and some other areas. So it came to me pretty clear that I needed to 
unfortunately leave home and I decided Germany and Germany's been home now for the past nearly three and a half years. Wow, that's excellent. So can you explain a little bit about what CAR-T therapies are? I know I'm excited about them. Some people may not know what CAR-T therapies are. So I just thought it might help to to go back to the beginning and the definition of CAR-T and, and maybe explain what it does. Yeah, I'll try and give you a simple answer for a very complex topic and I'll see how I go. And I'll try not to give a very thesis length description about what is actually a CAR-T. So first of all, you need to really understand about the T cells in the immune system. And so T cells are a very powerful white blood cell where they have got the ability to recognize an antigen that is presented by an antigen presenting. So normally the T cell will recognize the antigen by the antigen presenting cell by the T cell receptor and the antigen presenting cell will present this protein fragment which we've bound to another molecule to the T cell receptor. So generally that's how things work. It's a bit more complicated, but obviously just for the purpose of this, let's leave it like that. And normally what happens is when that antigen which is bound to that molecule on the antigen presenting cell is recognized by the T cell receptor on the T cell, what happens is that the T cell will then release these cytotoxic granules which can then kill other cells. And then it's also got the ability to undergo proliferation of the T cell as well. So you can have this large population of those cells. So if you think about it in the context of what it's like when you're being infected with a pathogen, so like a virus or bacteria, you have a bacteria, they've got a specific um, little antigen, which has been sort of part of the outer membrane, if you will. And then that's eaten by another and then it gets presented by this molecule. So then this like little part of the outside of the pathogen is presented on this molecule of antigen presenting. It's recognized by the T cell. And then you have this big population of cells which then expand and then can go ahead and actually find this other antigen which is expressed on the pathogen. So you can have a lot of killing of this. So it's a really cool way to get a lot of cells, a lot of in vivo activity where you can actually get a lot of cell death done inside the body as well. And this is what happens when it comes to fighting bacteria, fighting viruses as well. And then if you think about how with the vaccines and the approach that's been taken recently as well, it's really quite interesting because it's not identical, but it's using some similar principles. You're using the um, genetic material, which is coming from the virus, which is then being expressed into a protein fragment. So then it can be presented by this molecule and antigen presenting cell to the T cell. So then if you were to be infected with, let's say, COVID, where you can then go ahead and then the T cells which recognize the virus which causes COVID can go ahead and find the virus and then hopefully eradicate the virus. So that's immunology 101. What CAR T cells are is actually, it stands for chimeric antigen receptor T cell. So a CAR molecule is a chimeric antigen receptor, which comprises of many different parts of a molecule from T cells normally. So you've got the antigen recognition domain, which is what recognizes, okay, this is what I'm going to find and this is what I'm going to attack. And this is very similar to what you would actually find on an antibody. So if you know that, if you remember, antibodies are very specific proteins, which can then bind to something. There's a particular domain on the antibody which will then bind to that particular antigen. And so we've got that same recognition domain on the CAR molecule, so it's very specific. Then you've also got a transmembrane domain to keep things in place together. Then sometimes after that, you might have a couple of two stimulatory molecules which actually help with the intracellular function to make sure that the CAR T cell survives, grows, proliferates, expands and so forth. And then after that, you've actually got the CD3 zeta molecule as well. And the CD3 zeta molecule is just there to provide some extra um, T cell activation and signaling as well on the inside part. So you've got these different parts which form up the chimeric part of the receptor. And so what a CARB molecule is, is that it's a very specific way of recognizing cancer or some type of other molecule where it goes, okay, I can find this and then I can attack it hopefully eradicate it, and then persist within the patient with no problems. 
So generally speaking right now, a lot of the CAR T cells are very, they come from the same patient. So therefore, it's what we call autologous CAR T cell therapies. And because they're from the same patient going back into the same patient, it's a very personalized approach to treating cancer these days as well. So it's very different to the traditional ways where you might get chemotherapy or radiotherapy, which is very systemic and basically it doesn't, yeah, it's not very specific at all, which is one of the problems. So it's a really exciting way to actually be able to treat cancer and there's been a lot of encouraging results so far. Yeah, so my understanding is that the process for essentially developing this for somebody would be that they pull out, essentially take blood from you, take white blood cells, those blood cells then are you know extracted for T cells, and then eventually it's rejoined again with the, the CAR portion of it. Is that correct? Yeah, I think we can probably immediately imagine that it's really much more complex than just any other type of therapy that exists right now. It's sure. much more different than paracetamol or whatever. Mm-hmm. It's not in tablet form. So let's imagine a particular scenario where you've got a patient which is in Germany, and the manufacturing center for CAR T cells might be somewhere in the US. Let's just say anywhere in the US. So generally what it would look is that you will have the patient. They will need to be have their cells harvested at one point. Then after the cells have been harvested, they will need to be then sent to the manufacturing center in the US. So you can imagine, okay, you're working with live cells. I need to get these cells to the manufacturing center in good condition. So there's a lot of quality around that as well, which is incredibly important. Then after the cells have been received and then they've been said to say, okay, cool, they're good quality. We can then move forward with the manufacturing process, which can be quite complex. So generally speaking, you might want to do a T cell selection from the very beginning to make sure you've got a nice population of T cells to start with. I often used to say to the customers I used to work with in Australia, I don't know about you, but we actually say rubbish in, rubbish out. Oh, sure. Yeah, garbage (laughs) in, garbage out in the US. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. If you start off with a poor product at the very beginning, you most likely end up with something poor at the end. So this just helps with making sure you've got a good quality product at the end. So after you've isolated your T cells, you might want to do an activation. And this actually helps with the genetic transduction sometimes, but also just helps get the cells growing and happy and everything. And after that, you will then want to follow through with your genetic engineering part. So this is the really interesting part, which is very unusual to a lot of us now. And this is where actually using a a replication incompetent virus to actually infect the genetic material which contains the CAR molecule into the cells. So again, so this is a, a lot of work to establish this as well because you need to be able to show that they're safe and how effective they are as well. So it's really tough. So after you've introduced the CAR molecule genetic material from the virus into the cells, you then will probably want to continue to grow the cells for a little while and to make sure you've actually got enough cells to be able to treat the patient. And then after that, then you need to prepare them for the final dose. So obviously with all these different types of therapies, you can imagine that they need to be at their specified dose, which is found from the clinical trials. But the interesting also thing that needs to happen is that while all this is happening is that, oh, I should actually say that, you also then need to ship them back to the patients as well in a healthy state. Right. Which is also yeah. important. To know. Yeah. But while this is all happening, you need to be able to what we term lymphodeplete the patient. So this is where you want to actually give the patient some chemotherapy to actually deplete a lot of the cells in the body as it is. And this is to make room for the CAR T cells to be put into the patient. So therefore, they're not going to have a crowded space for them to live and survive. And so this all really carefully needs to be timed because you can imagine, okay, you've got products at the beginning which are quite critical with their logistics and shelf life and the manufacturing process. There are a a lot of critical control steps. Then you need to deplete the patient of their lymphoid system. And then with that as well, you need to make sure that you do it at a time so you don't want to have too much of a big gap between when they finish their chemotherapy there to actually get in their CAR T cells because otherwise they're going to be susceptible to getting sick. And then obviously you want to make sure that the 
site where the patient is, does receive the cells in good condition and can infuse them and they've got all the safety material to actually show that they are safe to be given to the patient and then they can be given to the patient. So the journey for CAR T cell therapy is actually quite long and quite exhaustive and very different to what a lot of us have had to think about in the past. And I think a lot of regulatory agencies these days are actually acknowledging that, okay, we need to find new ways to actually support these types of innovative therapies. COVID is another example of that. I think we're all learning a lot from COVID recently, but I think, yeah, they're just realizing, okay, we've got these potential to actually make a lot of headway with these patients. We can do a lot of good with these patients. And there's a really big unmet medical need as well. So we need to find ways which expedites this as quickly as possible. So there's specific types of cancer that are good for CAR T therapy and other types of cancer that just are not? So right now there are, and we had the latest FDA approval for another CAR T cell drug on Friday, which was really quite exciting. And by we, a general community, obviously. And just obviously, I'm not licensed to give medical advice right now as well, but there are four approved CAR T cell therapies. And they're all targeting the CD19 antigen on different B cell malignancies. So this is where it's been shown to be really quite effective and really beneficial for the patient as well. They're in a range of different pediatric or adult malignancies, but they all target CD19 itself. And then are there any issues that are associated with getting CAR-T therapies? I know I've read of some, but would, would love to, to know from your experience if, you've, if you know of them and then also what's being done to try and offset that. CRS or cytokine release syndrome is one. There's also another one called, it's recently been renamed as ICANS. So this is immune effector cell associated neuropathy syndrome, something along the lines of that. It's a very long abbreviation, which is basically where you get neurotoxicity. So these are generally the two biggest side effects that physicians normally start to become aware and they want to monitor very closely with their patients. So cytokine release syndrome or CRS is basically, if you imagine that the T cells, which I talked about previously, they go ahead, they recognize the particular bad thing in the body, they'll release the chemical, the cytokines in the body, which will eventually destroy the pathogen or whatever's there. What cytokine release syndrome is basically where you've got the CAR T cell, which is then going ahead and doing its thing. It's actually finding the CAR T cell. It's finding all this tumor mass, wherever it may be. It's releasing these chemicals as it should be. But it's the fact that there's such a large amount of tumor that the CAR T cells are going ahead and releasing these chemicals, but then it can have an effect on the patient's body itself. So that's one thing. And ICANS is a little bit similar, but it affects the neurotoxicity, neurological function of the patient. Again, I'm not a physician, but I've seen some presentations from doctors where they actually show the assessments of the neurotoxicity and you can, they do writing assessments. And so what they do is they ask the patient to write a sentence like every hour or every day. And you can gradually see the patient's handwriting get worse, where it just almost looks like a scribble. It's really crazy to see that you think that this would ever happen. But then as with CRS and Neurotox, they're both transient. So they can be managed and they can go away quite effectively, very easily. Oh, nice. I think when we started treating patients with CAR T cells, we didn't know what was going. We didn't know what was happening. We really had to rely upon the expertise of different medical professions to actually help everyone and to actually manage CRS and neurotoxicity diseases. Just because, yeah, everyone has got different experience. If you look at the bone marrow transplant surgeons, these are the ones who are able to really provide a lot of expertise and support to actually go, this is what the patient is experiencing. And so from the very beginning, like it was quite, I don't want to say terrible, but it was quite difficult for a lot of physicians to know what to do and how to do things. But definitely everyone's come a long way now as well. And I wouldn't, I don't think people are as scared as they used to be when it comes to actually treating patients because of the adverse events, because they're much more confident now, especially with everything that's going on, that they can manage this as well. 
And in addition to that as well, people know that you can also use different types of therapies or other approved drugs to actually manage CRS and neurotox as well. So you can use steroids, you can use different monoclonal antibodies to actually soak up the soluble cytokine within the patient as well. So there's different ways which we are now realizing that we can manage this disease and adverse event much easier. I, I just have to love where the science currently is with us. The idea that, to your point about COVID, right, the story that I heard with COVID was essentially you had a virus that the body couldn't identify as a virus, which is the main reason why you would just take over because the body didn't know to fight it. So then you could at all take something and then say, hey, this is a virus to the T cells and then send them back in to go kill it is a pretty, pretty tremendous thing. And then, you know, now with cancer as well, there's so much good work that's going on. And this therapy sounds extremely exciting for the future. Is there anything that, that you could see on the horizon that, that you can talk about in terms of CAR T therapies and the way that we might see them accelerate or further impact the patient population? Yes, definitely a lot of ways I can imagine that. So first up, I think there are a lot of companies which are just trying to identify new cancers which they can work with because I think it's always about finding the right cancer with the right antigen that you need to be able to recognize. So again, without going into too much detail, you need to make sure that the for a car molecule, it needs to be the antigen that on the cancer needs to be expressed on the surface. So this means it needs to be on the outside of the cancer cell. So we need to limit that. So that gives us something to work with. But then at the same time as well, if you know anything about CD19, which is what the current approved CAR T cell therapies are targeting, CD19 is actually also expressed on healthy um, cells as well, on healthy B cells. But okay, cool. So what is the best antigen that we need to look for that is on the surface now? So again, so it's trying to find something unique there. So finding the right antigen and finding the right disease is really important. Novel approaches for actually targeting different therapies. So you can target one or two therapies, maybe with the same molecule. This is a way to go. So you've got a really complete B-cell ablation. You might want well, ablation of anything. You might also want to think about, okay, how can I manage the safety and toxicity a little bit more as well? So there are some approaches there where people are, editing the CAR T cell even more. So you put the CAR molecule in, but you take something out as well. And you can do all these crazy combinations. It's always about finding the right co-stimulatory molecule as well. So we know that there are some co-stimulatory molecules which work really quite well with the CD19 CAR T cell. But if we go to a CD20, you might need something completely different again. So it's trying to find that, it's trying to find the right combination. It's also about the manufacturing process as well. And what is the best way? What is the most efficient way to do manufacturing as well? Right now, we know that a lot of people go, okay, you need to manufacture in one particular center. It's very hands-on, very labor intense. Have you ever done any cell culture work, Don? Yes. Yeah, I yes. actually have. Yeah. yeah, so you know what it's like doing cell culture. You know how you can be doing it, and then you can teach me how to do something, and it'll be still different. Even sure. if you follow the closest protocols, it's still going to be different. And that's sort of what it's like for CAR T-cell therapy as well. No matter how much you're trying to control it, you're still going to be having these manual hands doing the pipetting, doing all the actions that are required to actually grow these cells. So actually to try and simplify the manufacturing process is going to be really quite important, especially to meet the demand for future patients. And then I think, like I talked about before, how these are all currently right now autologous CAR T cell therapy. So from the patient going back into the patient. So what happens if we can try and make an allogeneic approach, which is where we can have cells from a healthy donor and then they can grow them up, they can manipulate them so they can put the CAR molecule in, take other stuff out type thing like I talked about before and grow these up to such large numbers that you can have tens or hundreds of batches ready to go into patients where it can actually treat the patient and not have to worry about some of the adverse events that might be associated with giving an allogeneic cell product as well. This is a really exciting approach as well. So there's definitely a lot going on and enough to keep us busy for a little while.
<laughs> yeah, it sounds like that's the case. And But this is the way I see types of therapies grow in the space in general, right? It's not a fast process for a lot of different reasons, and a lot of them are good reasons. And it, it, all in all, I could see that there's a real advantage to, to these therapies, and I'm just excited for anybody that happens to benefit from the technology. So thanks for all your work there. There are three questions that I like to ask every guest. What inspires you? Right now, what inspires me are the patients that we're doing this for. I, it's a little bit different, but back in the days when I was working marketing, I would always got told to think, okay, what is in it for the customer? What, how is the customer going to use this? Why is the customer going to benefit from this? Now, for me, it's the patients. And these are the people who really inspire me to actually make sure we have the best drug out there for the patient population we're trying to target. Some of the stories we hear about where patients are running out of options for treatment and then they don't know what to do anymore as well. And to know that we've got something really exciting provides me with a lot of hope. That's excellent. And what concerns you? So... Full disclosure, I actually did my research on podcasts, like any good researcher, and I heard that you were going to ask this question. So I've been thinking about this for such a long time to try and think what is the best answer for this specific question. And you know what? Even today to this, I still don't know if I could even think what concerns me because I think I'm generally optimistic and I like to think that a lot of things are transient. So therefore, we are experiencing a lot of bad things right now. But for me, what concerns me is the world sometimes, and that's very dire. But I think there are just so many things going on, whether it be politically, socially, environmentally, health-wise as well. There's just so much going on as well, but I'm optimistic that things will get better. So that's what keeps me up at night. There have been a few people that have answered similarly along the way, and I'm sure you've heard it now that you said that, say that you've done your research. And that I can fully understand there there has to be some sort of a point where we learn how to accept each other, where we learn how to get along overall, but also the state of the world with COVID is it, it, it puts us all somewhat in isolation to not work on that same collective again. So you can't see people in the coffee shop the same way that you used to, or go out for a beer, especially in, in Germany. <laughs> so the yes, thing exactly. I would want to <laughs> Absolutely. And what excites and you? Oh. I was about to say, and the final question is what excites me. I knew that as well. <laughs> <laughs> and we started to talk about it before, but the fu what excites me is the future of science and medicine. I think what we have achieved right now is incredible. And I talked about some of the technological advances that I see will happen. I don't know if they'll happen in the next one, two years, five years, but they will happen. And this is really exciting to me as well, because I think like a lot of us, again, focusing on cancer, a lot of us have probably been touched by cancer in some way as well. And to know that we're going to be able to make a difference in these patients' lives and to actually help these people, is just, that's exciting to me. And yeah. I like to think that I'm young enough to actually be able to see it as well in my lifetime as well. So I hope that will happen. Yeah, that's just based on what we're on the cusp of right now. And there's so many great things from a cancer perspective overall in general, whenever you think about where we're at with infectious diseases, all of those things I think are tremendous advances in terms of science. And we are getting to this point of truly trusting science and accelerating some of those things is absolutely exciting. Thanks for being on the podcast. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Life Science Success. For complete details about this podcast, including show notes, how to get in touch with guests, and more episodes, please visit www.lifesciencesuccess.com. If there's someone you'd like for us to invite to the show as a guest, please let me know by sending me a message at the podcast website. Please click subscribe on your favorite podcast app, share the podcast, or tell a friend about it. And last but not least, rate the podcast. Thank you again. Thank you again.